Good Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to the VolQuest podcast, VolQuest.com, and as always, on the VolQuest YouTube channel. Like this video if you're watching on the channel, and please subscribe to the channel as always. Brent Hubbs, Rob Lewis, Austin Price, I am Mary Kane. A whole lot to get into as we move on through now the month of February. And big news from last week, Tennessee has a tight ends coach. His name is Alec Ablin. Joined us on the Rocky Top Rewind uh, the other night and uh, did a really, really great job there. But Austin, I did want to ask you, in my opinion, one of the more pressing questions about this hire, this promotion from within, is the fact that he's never been off of campus recruiting. How big of a factor is that and how much of a learning curve will that be for Tennessee's new tight ends coach? Well, I mean, it would be hard to think that there's not going to be a learning curve, Eric. Um, Now, I think, you know, some of recruiting, not all of it, but some of it comes down to want to. And, you know, I think Alec Abelman's going to have a strong want to. He knows, he personally knows that that's kind of where his hangup's going to be because he's never done it before. And it's not against him. I mean, it's not his fault. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, I, I think that he's got some solid people around him, whether it be Rodney Garner, Brian Sean Marie. Um, that are in the building, you know, and even even some nice resources, you know, that are off the field that understand what it takes in recruiting. And so um, I, I think he'll lean on those people. Um, again, I think he's eager. I think he's going to ask questions. And I do think he has the component to build relationships, which is why the current team is very fond of him because he knows how to talk to kids. He obviously knows how to connect with kids. It's just a little fractionally different in recruiting because you're connecting in smaller sample sizes and you're going up against other schools. There's no competition when you're when you're when you're getting to know Cooper Mays or Jerome Carvin or whoever, or in this instance for a tight end like Jacob Warren and McAllen Castles. But it still boils down to can you connect? And I do think he can. Again, though, I think there will be a learning curve understanding how often you contact, you know, how much you stay on these kids, how hungry you are to land these players. Yeah, I, I think for me, the, the biggest part of the, re, the recruiting part, I mean, look, you're, he's 25, 26 years old, whatever he is. I mean, I think he's going to be able to relate to kids. But, Rob, for me, the biggest challenge for any young recruiter is sorting through the weeds of what's realistic and what's not realistic. Okay, and and I think that that's I think anybody covering recruiting has to sort through that. Right. Just because just because a kid's mentioning you and he talks to you on the phone, do you have a realistic chance to get him? You know, you don't want to have a defeatist attitude. Hey, I can't go in that state and get somebody, Rob. But at the same time, too, you can't you know, you can't hang your hat on a kid from, you know, college X hometown and and say maybe that. Yeah, we we can absolutely pull that one out of there. that's the hard part that I think any young recruiter has is trying to figure out what's realistic and what's not realistic. Yeah. However, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's in, in, in either e- any of the sports that we cover. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I would imagine that you and AP will agree that a lot of times what you're talking about with you, know, you got all that youthful enthusiasm. We you need to balance that with some, you know, some realistic maturity. I mean, like what you're talking about, just because a kid takes your call and, the mom likes you doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're in there. And I think when you get older, you, you learn to kind of read those signs. I, I would, uh, I, w- I would not think that Alden's age would be much of an impediment. In fact, I think it'll be a, a boost in terms of, you know, what you think you can, you can do as far as, you know, how much you can have on your plate. But I guess th- this is a great analogy that the assistant coach using me once. And he's like, when you, when you're young, it's like you recruit like, like you're, like you're shooting a shotgun you know, huge spread, you know, wide range. And as you get older, you recruit more like you're shooting a rifle, more focus, you know, fewer, you know, not, not as much, not as much of spread on your target, but, but like you're talking about her, a lot more realistic. AP, they're shooting like a sniper recruiting off of the tackles right now, right? <laughs> Just a couple, right? They, they got to, they got to give me that shotgun mentality. Um, we asked uh, Alec Avelin about um, his background as an offensive lineman. Remember, he played offensive lineman, at, played offensive line at Missouri, and he's coached with Glenn Ellerby a couple different stops, including helping him out here a little bit at Tennessee. Uh, ask him about that background, how that will help him becoming a tight ends coach here in Knoxville. And he was kind of funny off the top. Give this a listen. This is a, a little bit from the Rocky Top Rewind the other night uh, with Tennessee's new tight ends coach Alec Avelin. 
people forget I was actually so bad at blocking people my uh, senior year. I actually got moved to a tight end fullback role. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, that's one of the things I think about Coach Hype. And, uh, you know, I started games until an injury uh, my junior year as a guard. And um, going into my senior year, got beat out. And I think on a lot of places and a lot of programs, um, it's just kind of tough and is what it is. And um, we had some special tight ends at Missouri at that time, but people were banged up. And for Coach Hype to see not just an opportunity to give me a role, but be able to help and um, – kind of shifted that room, like made that year so much fun for me, just in that I still had a role. And as far as football just grew in my love of the game, as far as how it translates to tight end play, I think the run game is obvious. Um, schematically, we're all on the same page. It all fits. There's really six guys, a back and a quarterback that are making the run game go protection wise, um, not just who they're supposed to be on, which I think is, maybe the hardest part, but how to actually get them blocked. Um, but don't get it twisted. I think in the route, um, I've been in this offense since I was 20 years old. I've been in the staff room since I was 22. You see a lot, you learn a lot. Um, you understand space. I'm a football junkie at heart. So to me, that part of the game is really exciting. And something that just cause I'm an O-lineman, um, still feel really confident about that side of it as well. So no worry, according to Alec Ablin, a lot of confidence in himself, knowing the game, knowing the system, as he should. As he pointed out, he's been in this offense since he was 20 years old and been in the meeting rooms ever since. But Austin, you know, that tight end position is so critical to this Tennessee offense. Do you think that his background on the offensive line will help him in that regard? Uh, I think in certain ways, sure. Um, I, I do think the best thing going for him in the short term is that, you know, outside of Ethan Davis, he has a very mature room. Um you know, whether it's Jacob Warren, who's around for year number 46, McAllen Castles, who's, you know, you know, in his final year of eligibility, even guys like Charlie Browder have been around. So, like, you know, for my liking, you know, I think that helps him going into 2023 is he's not trying to corral, mold, um, you know, kind of get under control. Some kids that are just out of high school that don't know, you know, again, what they don't know. Um, and instead he's got, he has a group that knows how to, to kind of, you know, attack practice, attack the weight room, attack the meeting room, you know, get in, get out, get your work done and, and, you know, all that stuff. So, you know, I think that definitely helps him going into this year. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I think the maturity that that group has should, should pay dividends for him because, because it's not just their maturity and, and age that they're also, um, they're not problem guys, right? I mean, like it's it's a little different. I mean, than, than if you inherited a you know a young group of receivers or a young group of running backs, you know, and the egos are a little bit different and and that type of thing. I mean, Jacob Warren um, is is a a non ego guy, right? And um, you know, Castle, I and mean, they're going to play both those guys. They know they're going to play. The question is, what can he develop behind them when you look at the short term? Because you know, they were lucky last year. They, they were extremely fortunate that Jacob Warren didn't get hurt. You know, he was available, and, and Princeton Fant played the entire year. So, um, you know, depth will be a concern, but Austin's exactly right, Eric. I mean, he, he inherits a group that already knows how to work, um, and and they're not they're not problematic people, you know. I mean, it's not like he's got to babysit any of those guys. And, and I think that, that, that can help your transition when you're not having to, you know, rob – Make sure, make sure somebody's in class. Make sure somebody's at workouts on time and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That that makes for an easier transition into your first year managing a room. Last thing I do want to say on this, though, Rob, is, you know, this is the third internal hire that Josh Heupel has made. Uh, going back to last offseason, promoting Kelsey Pope when Cody Burns left the staff, now promoting Joey Halsley up at the offensive coordinator, and then here with Alec Ablin. Um, you know, we say it all the time, very secretive, very protective of his offense, but also it, just because it is so unique in the system that you run, I mean, it's a seamless transition. Um, Alec Ablin is obviously the most unproven so far to take this internal promotion, but you got to start somewhere, right? This is going to be a high uh, you know, calling card at least for now, and something I think we should expect moving forward. Yeah, and I don't know that any – have we ever seen anything like it? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, not not three openings, you know, in three in, internal promotions. And, you know, to me, that I mean, it tells you a lot about Coach Heupel. 
um, you know, about what, what he thinks about bringing people into his organization to, to begin with. I mean, even not at high level positions. I mean, obviously, you know, he had a, had a good feeling or something that he liked about all these guys, you know, and obviously, you know, you see Pope and Alvin's, you know, or excuse me, uh, Halsley and Alvin's played for him. He's got, these are long-term relationships. I mean, that obviously means something to him. He's got confidence in, in the, in these dudes, you know, despite their age. And, you know, to, to me, I, I mean, I, to, I look at it as a, as a positive, because certainly, I mean, I think we all know, I mean, he's, if he wants to go out and make a splash hire, not necessarily a tight end, but certainly an offensive coordinator. I mean, he's got the money to do that at wide receiver and he's got the resources and, and to him, I mean, he, he, he pretty much showed you what's most important is that he, he knows guys, they know him, they know the culture, they know the expectations. I'll be surprised if it doesn't work out. Uh, oh, I kind of on that. I got one more point to, to ask one more question rather Austin, you know, why, why wasn't it Jeff Ferris? Why wasn't it somebody else? And I've heard you, you know, make the comment, and this is kind of self-explanatory. The longer this thing went on, the more it was looking like it was going to be an internal hire. But to the best of your knowledge, kind of why wasn't it anybody else rather than going with this internal hire? Well, I think for Jeff Ferris, you know, you know, I, I, again, I just think that Coach Heupel decided to, to stay in the building. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, when they talked, um, I think that, you know, that they liked Jeff Ferris a lot. You know, Jeff Ferris, before he went to UCLA, actually interviewed for a QC spot last year, um, you know, when, 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 you know, he was no longer going to be back at Duke. And in reality, you know, had, had he taken that job um, or not gotten the UCLA job, which is an on-the-field Power 5 job, had he not gotten the UCLA job and, you know, been a QC at Tennessee, maybe he does move into this role, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, again, I think Coach Heupel, I think some of the most, you know, I guess my biggest point would be, it, to me, maybe looking at this now, two years in Hubbard, and really, I know he's, Eric says three, but it's really it's replacing two coaches. Like he, the the natural the natural form of a staff is OC, which is normally a quarterbacks coach. Tennessee's had this weird OC that's a tight ends coach deal, and now they've kind of got it realigned. But I, I guess from you know from you know I guess my thought process going forward two years in is maybe we need to pay attention to who he hires as a QC on the offensive side of the ball. Maybe those are maybe some of the most important hires he makes if he's planning on kind of going that route. Defensively, I'm not sure he will do that. You know, maybe. I mean, you know, I, I guess, you know, Chop would be someone, you know, if, if you know, somebody left potentially could get a look. Um, but it feels like maybe defensively might go back outside. But offensively, um, you know, I, I think the word is protective. I think that's the right word. Um, you know, when, when they're kind of describing Josh Heupel and kind of, you know, how he wants to go about things. Well, this I mean, the offense is his baby. No offense to Joey Halsley, no offense to Alex Golish or, or whoever else his OC is. I mean, it's his system. He's betting on himself on that side of the ball. He's always going to bet on himself on that side of the ball. Um, and, and he's going to do what, what he thinks um, fits, fits the offense. And I think he felt like in this case that a seamless transition – made more sense to him than bringing someone in um, fr- from the outside to, to learn the system. You look at it, it's a little surprising that he hired Alex Golish at Central Florida, you know, because there was no tie there. And he brought in an outside guy who kind of bounced up and, and moved up the ranks pretty quick with with Josh Heupel there. On the other side of the ball, um, he, he's defensively, he's always going to lean on his coordinator and, and, and his coordinator's voice and what his coordinator wants – um, and needs on that side are, are going to be great. I, I think that's a – when you look at Josh Heupel long-term defensively, his coordinator is his defensive head coach, right, Austin? I mean, if, if the coordinator has an opening, then I think – or there's a defensive staff opening and he has a coordinator in place, then I think that coordinator is going to have a huge say in who that position coach is. You look at it when he was hired, he hired his whole defensive staff first, basically, and then hired his coordinator. But, Austin, we know all those defensive assistants – had a voice in Tim Bank and whether or not they thought Tim Banks was the right fit for him. I think he will lean more on his defensive coaches, a little more on his own gut on the offensive side of the ball. And I think it'll always be that way for Josh Heupel because it's his offense. 
We transition now to Tennessee basketball, and it was an up and down week, uh, you know, for the Volunteers this past year, or this past week, a one on one record, of course, uh, losing in Florida, 50, 67 to fifty four, getting the win over Auburn. That was a quad one win. It didn't feel like it, but it was a quad one win, forty six forty three. Uh, Rob Lewis, um, get kind of overall thoughts on last week's play that. Um, some good defense, some elite defense, some number one ranked defense in the country against Auburn, but the offense struggled in both of those tilts. Yeah, I mean, they scored eighty nine points in, in, in you know combined games and and went one and one. That's that's the amazing part. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I totally get where fans are coming from. I, mean, I think for a team that's you know the rankings will be out here in a little bit. I, you know, Tennessee will be still be in the top five or right on the fringe the way things were last week, but. You know, it doesn't. If, if you're just walking around talking to people, certainly if you're reading message boards, it doesn't feel that way. You know, and I think it's it's because of the offense, because they have such a hard time scoring, that um, you know, people don't don't have a ton of confidence in this team, even though we're in the first week of February and and they're one win away from from picking up number twenty. Rob, where do you put that win um, in, in the annuals uh, of Tennessee? What, what does it compare to that Conzo Georgetown game? Where does it compare to that Kevin O'Neill Penn State? That might have been an overtime game at Penn State, but I think it was like 46 45 or somewhere like that. Where, where, where does that offense uh, where does that offense show up compared to those two? Well, Pat? I mean, you have to rank it ahead just because Tennessee won the game as opposed to, you know, somebody who had the, the pleasure of being in the arena that night at Georgetown and then, you know, four or five days later at Virginia for, you know, what was almost a mirror image. Um, man, it's just just tough. And Auburn's good defensively, but when, when you put it on the heels of, you know, how bad they were at Florida, it just – I don't want to push the panic button. And again, I mean, right. this is a top five team. It's going to be a, a one, one or a two seed in the tournament, but it just, you know, you worry that, that the offense could pop up and they're not, you know, I don't know if they're winning a game in March, if that's the case. And, and um, what, what, what are teams doing defensively? It, it, let, let me rephrase this. Is this a situation where Tennessee is just cold right now and people are wondering about legs or they're losing their legs? Or is this a situation where defensively, legitimately Florida and, and Auburn did something different than what Texas did and what some Mississippi state and some other teams did to Tennessee, Rob. No, I thought I'll, I'll need somebody, you know, a, a smarter basketball guy to me to really, you know, get into the nuances. But I, I thought Florida was different than Auburn. I, mean, I, th- I thought Florida really made a concerted effort to, you know, extend the defense, press up on the guards. I mean, ch- chase guys all, off the three point line or, or at least, you know, chase them, a foot or two, you know, t- two feet back from where the open shots were. I mean, all- Auburn, you know, certainly played good defense, but I didn't. And again, somebody that knows more about the game may, may have a different opinion. I didn't feel like Auburn just sold out the way that Florida did. I-, I thought against Auburn, it was more about missing shots that, you know, I don't know, you say guys normally make, but that I-, I thought they missed a lot of open shots at Auburn. And, you know, there was some of that at Florida, but I, I-, I really thought about against Florida, I thought it was more about, you know, the, how the Gators executed their plan. I, I just thought Tennessee was playing bad uh, offensively against Auburn. Didn't have a ton, did not have a ton, ton of turnovers. You couldn't blame 46 points on that. Um, just, man, could, could not knock anything down. I, I will, I said this on the locker room Sunday night, and, and I felt it'll get, well, somebody will go, they are who they are, man. They are who they are. But I, I still think you, you, you want them, like, if they're going to play this way, it's okay if they're playing like having these kind of games right now. You can't afford to have these games a month from now. Like, you know, one month from now, you can't have 44 points and 45 points and 48 points. You you have to have your offensive, uh, you know, best in March. And too many times Tennessee's peaked in late January and early February and then got to early March and, and the SEC tournament, Not maybe not last year, but the other years, and then the NCAA tournament and kind of, you know, look like the Braves bats in the nineties. Like that, that to me, like, you know, again, I, I know you've got a month ago, got them. They still got to prove it, but like, I, I'm not get super concerned right now. If they're still shooting the ball like this a month from now, then they, they definitely are who they are at that point. Rob, I asked this to Grant the other night on the rewind. What, what's going on with Santiago Vescovi? I mean, does he, he does not look right. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, neither he – you won't hear him say it. You won't hear Coach Barnes say it. Nobody's using his shoulder as an excuse. But um, 
in in the three two one for you know mon- Monday morning. Just went and looked at the numbers, and you, know, you don't have to do a, a huge deep dive. Um, the, his shooting, you know, in the you know two three weeks before he re-injured that shoulder against Kentucky, um, was was off the charts. I mean, it was an outlier. He was making over fifty percent for three. So I'm not saying that, I mean that wasn't going to be sustainable, but still, that was that was five or six games, and then you got five games since he you know got the shoulder dinged against Kentucky, missed the Mississippi State game, and he's shooting under thirty percent for three. And I mean, to me, it, it's pretty cut and dry. It doesn't it does not look like he's a hundred percent. I mean, to me too. Like he's not even like for 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 Sonsi, I mean, seven shots is is not a lot, not a lot. You know, that, that's all he took the other night. I mean, he there was three players that shot the ball in double figures, and he was not one of them. And, and that's typically uncharacteristic of him. So I don't know. He, he just doesn't necessarily look like himself. I mean, that's for sure. Rob, don't they just have? I mean, and I know this may be they are who they are, but I mean to to get to get Santi and those guys better shots, you know Tyreek Key and those guys. I, I mean, something has to happen in the paint. I mean, yep. it, I mean, it, you're, it's easy to drive the guards off the three point line if you're not if if you ever you don't have to play help defense in the paint. Like you never have to step away from your man. I mean, you can literally just kind of lock onto somebody's hip right now until Tennessee finds something. Um, in the post, and and I think you you wrote about Adu. I mean, one, having to step up, or, or there's going to be a moment in time where Tennessee is going to have to do something in the post if they're going to advance, right? Yeah, and, and legit. I mean, I would love to, I would love to know that you know what the actual number is because I'm sure they chart this. How many times do you think Tennessee had a post player doubled this year by the opposing defense? I mean, I bet, I bet it's not you? happened. I mean, why I mean, would you? Not you know maybe when Olivier was going ten for ten at South Carolina or something, but I just. Um. Yeah, the the fact that they just don't get easy stuff in there. I don't think it's a coincidence that the best they've looked recently was you know against Texas when Olivier played out of his mind. I mean, had the game of his life, and um, you know, Tennessee scored eighty plus points against you know a, a pretty good basketball team in Texas. But yet, uh, the post offense is is a concern that's not going away. However. Robbie, get round two against Vanderbilt uh, for the midweek. That game's on the road, 7 o'clock, which is nice for a central time game. Typically, they make those a little later on. Then you got Missouri back at home on Saturday. Uh, how bi- how important is this week for Tennessee's offense to get back in rhythm, considering what's after these two games in Alabama and Kentucky? Yeah, they got a gauntlet coming up. And then, out, not just Alabama and Kentucky, you go to Texas A&M, which are yeah. you know, three of the five best teams in the league by record. Uh, this week – I I would look for Tennessee's offense to get to get right, but also if I was fan, if I was a fan, I would take that with a grain of salt. It's because Vanderbilt's the worst defensive team in the league. Missouri is not far behind in, in both points given up and, and opponent field goal percentage. And you know, this not both of them are not afraid to play fast, but their bad defense is not a result of pace of play. I mean, people are are making a ton of shots against them. So I'd look for Tennessee to get, to get back to you know, scoring 75, 80 points this week. But again, I think you got to take the opponent into account. Is it sustainable? Get a huge week, you know, a huge stretch coming up after this. But I think I don't want to disrespect Vanderbilt, Missouri, but these are two games Tennessee should win. Would be big favorites in if you're struggling on offense like they are right now. This should be a week where you have a chance to get right. Uh, Rob, do you, do you feel like do you feel like Tennessee's passing up? Open looks. I mean, yes. you heard Rick Barnes say yes. that. Are, are they are they trying to be too finite on offense at times? I kind of think so. I mean, I and and I don't think you know fans see Rick yelling at kids and they think that kids are on edge. I really I don't think it's like that on offense. I mean, other than if you're sloppy with the ball and turn it over, you're not going to draw a lot of heat from the head coach on that end of the court. Not like you will on defense. I mean, he doesn't you know he doesn't want a dude taking a three with 24 seconds left on the clock, but. By and large, you know, if you're taking an, an open shot in rhythm, that's not that's not a fireball offense like it is if you go down and you know get beat on a back cut on, on defense. So I, I don't think kids are looking on, over their shoulder, um, on because you know, afraid to take shots early. But I do see a lot of it. I'm I'm sure I wrote about it. or We talked about it, but I can vividly remember Tyreek Key doing it a couple times on Saturday. Um, I thought Josiah. Turned down, turned down a couple, even though, you know, where would they have been without him having 15 and 14? But it's, I mean, I, I do think it's a problem. And, and where it shows up is not is at the end of the clock when you see Zakai jacking a 28-footer 
you know, with a hand in his face. I mean, I think they turned down those early looks, and oftentimes those are the best looks that they're getting in the clock. I, I, I think that Vanderbilt game is sneaky, Rob. Tennessee, I think if they get good co- post play offensively, they win this game by 15. But if they have a, a, a kind of one of those down games in the paint, I just don't think they're going to make shots from the outside at, at, over in Nashville. It, the sight lines in there, it's just different. Like, sight lines. It, it, I'm just telling you, like, I have no faith in them to make a bunch of outside shots. So if they don't make, you know, buckets, you know, from 12, 13 feet in, uh, I think this is a dogfight game. If, if they make those shots, I think they went by 10 plus. Well, Tennessee will be on the road Wednesday at Vanderbilt, as Austin's pointing out, and then back home against Missouri, 6 o'clock on Saturday at Thompson Bowling Arena. Uh, last thing I want to discuss here on uh, this Tuesday podcast, uh, Brent Hubs, it was a lot of chatter about Texas and Oklahoma coming to the SEC. Will they, won't they in 2024? Pete Thamel, first of ESPN, said that that was lot not likely to happen, that they were going to stay throughout the contract in 2025 and then come to the SEC um, and, and then later in the day, it was Brett McMurphy from the stadium reporting that a, an agreement essentially has already been taken place, but the hangup, shocker, I know, right? It's the TV deals with ESPN and the Big 12, or ESPN and Fox kind of fighting over those remaining TV deals. You know, what do you think is going to make of this? Is Oklahoma and Texas going to be in the SEC in 2024, or will it be in 2025? I remain still in the belief that the Big 12's got to get something, right? I mean, that's why I... I I thought they were going to be here a year earlier to begin with because they're not just going to get nothing from this, right? Well, one would think, you know, from, from a league standpoint, you would think the Big 12 would would want the cash, and, and I'm sure that they do. The X factor for them, though, is the TV deal and, and, and the requirements and, and the obligations with the TV deal. And we know how much the T and how important the TV money is and um, how, how, how difficult it is to broker TV deals. Everybody, Rob, wants a Big Ten SEC-type TV deal. The Big 12 has a hard time selling that. Is, is Fox interested in losing, you know, two of their marquee teams for television ratings a year early? And what are they going to replace them with? And what, what does Fox feel like their financial loss is with that? You know, how do they recoup some of that money? Um, it, it comes down to the end of the day, it's all about the dollars. And – you know, how much is uh, how much is everybody willing to pay to, to tear up a deal a year early and move forward? I think the Big 12 just wants cash, but Fox is standing in the way of going, wait a minute, don't forget about us. We factor into this thing as well. Yeah, I inadvertently did a deep dive on, on this subject this weekend and understand a lot more about it now than I did a few, a few days and ago. Us, Rob. I, well, I, I just didn't. I mean, I knew that Texas and Oklahoma would owe the Big 12 a, a big chunk of change. I mean, I think maybe $80 billion between them if they leave you know, in, in 2024, I didn't realize that Fox was like a separate entity of that. I mean, I thought that, I thought that whatever penalty Texas and Oklahoma would have to pay to the big 12 Fox was also taking their, you know, their compensation out of that. And that's not the case. Those are two, those are two different checks that the universities are going to have to stroke. And um, I, I, th- I think it'll get done earlier because I was again, say d- deep dive. I think it sounds or, reads like ESPN and Fox from working out or at least discussing trading inventory. Like Ohio State goes to Texas in a couple of years. You get, you know, as part of their compensation, Fox would get that game, even though that would be, you know, in ESPN. And there there are several examples like that where they might trade some trade trade some rights or, or trade the opportunity to broadcast some games. But it's at, at the end of the day, it's 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 gonna be tens and tens of millions of dollars for Texas and Oklahoma to leave, but everybody wants it. So is that, man, I, I think is that game already that. on the docket, Rob? Texas and Ohio State. It's one of the. I mean, it may not be te- maybe Ohio State, and Oklahoma, or you know, Michigan, Texas, but it's it's you know, you, you get what I'm saying. There's there's a couple of those coming down the pike that that would be marquee non conference matchups that that you know, as as a way to reach a resolution, maybe ESPN, you know, gives finds four or five of those. And, and gives to Fox, and and that helps kind of ease the transition. But at the end of the day, I mean, those two universities are still be writing big checks to, to leave. And why this is important is because obviously, when those two teams come, whether it's twenty four, whether it's twenty twenty five, I mean, the SEC is going to have to do some reshuffling. And the thought right now is it's going to go to a nine game conference schedule, the three six model, where, for example, Tennessee would have three permanent opponents every single year, Alabama, Vanderbilt, and for the sake of this conversation, Kentucky. And then you would rotate the other teams in the SEC and play every single team once every two years. If a player stayed at the university 
for four years, you would get to go to every single venue, which I think is interesting. It's either that or the eight game, you know, remaining in an eight game model with the one seven. Regardless, Austin, you know, once you just once you know when those two teams are coming, then you kind of have a path forward saying, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Or at least you can announce it and make it absolutely final to the public. Like, here's our plan. We're doing this. This is the new era of the SEC. Well, and no matter how they break it down, there's going to be a group that go, we got Rob, we got Shane. Oh, yeah. and look at By all the way, that. Austin, hey, tell me if I'm wrong. If you're a Tennessee fan and you got Alabama, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky, you take that every day, right? Well, yeah, you take that. But what if it's what about what if it's Alabama, Vanderbilt, and Florida? Like, would you take that? Because I'm not sure I'd want that. Like, I mean, you know, again, for forever, Tennessee's been playing, you know, especially the last, like, seven, eight years, they've played legitimately the top two teams in college football every year and then you throw in years where you know tennessee caught a&m really good you know even back in covid um a&m was a top 10 team when they played them back in 16 you know they they, they every it seemed like tennessee always kind of found a way to play somebody on their up year <laughs> when they rotated in um you know for, for tennessee like you know to be able to you know you know you hang on to alabama but you get georgia off the schedule that's a real win for Tennessee. Again, I know you're going to play Georgia once every two years, but you ain't playing them every year. So, um, you know, I, I think that's that's a positive. And, you know, I, I'm interested to kind of see how all this shakes out. But I do like the idea of getting everywhere in a four-year cycle. I think that that's, uh, that's good for the league, man. It's good for fans. And, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of good spots to go watch football games in this league. I'm I'm a seven two guy, but I'm gonna lose my I'm gonna lose my argument. Nobody cares out there what I think. I, I don't think there's enough teams with rivalries with three schools that make Oh yeah, hundred percent. That make that make that big of a difference. I mean I, I think you're trying to force something with with some of these teams that just don't have a natural rival. I think most teams have two, you know, rivals and, and you could you could rotate the, the other seven. But it's gonna go six three. I, I think the question is you know, right now you're just going to wait and not announce what your conference schedule looks like in 24 because you don't know who's going to be here. They've already moved matchups later on with SEC opponents. You know, they've already moved that Georgia game that was supposed to play who they, who they have. Oklahoma, I think, was who they were. They ended up playing Ball State now. Um, so those have already taken place in preparation for 24. So if it doesn't happen, then uh, you just wait another year. But you know, Rob's right. I mean, how how big a check is are those two schools willing to write, capable of writing? How much are they going to write, and and can they find any kind of negotiating power on the TV side of things? Because I think all of us underestimated um, the, the 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 financials with the TV influence and brokering out of a deal. I think it was more about everybody thought, you know, here's what you got to pay the Big Twelve. They're going to negotiate some kind of settlement because the Big Twelve needs money. But the TV side of things was was overlooked by a lot of people who assumed everybody was going to get out a year early. Isn't it Arkansas that claims to have like seven rivals? Like the SEC is trying so hard to make Arkansas like a rival with like Missouri and and some of those other schools. Like like who would Arkansas have in this model? Like the six three? Oh, they go back to their Big Twelve. I mean, they would play Oklahoma. I would I would say Oklahoma, Texas, Texas A and M would be where I would go, and that would be the old Big Eight matchups. Now. I don't know that that's who they would get because uh, they got to give somebody's got to give Missouri something, so they probably would get Missouri and and I, Oklahoma and A and M or somebody. I, I think what you're talking about, the, the the what you just referenced would have been if they went pods, that would have been their pod because that was always the model in the pod. Because I mean, how fair is that for Arkansas? A and M, Texas, Oklahoma, like that's what it's like Auburn. But you know, but again, what's Auburn's the point? Gonna, Auburn's yes. if you went off that, you know, if you're going off rivalries, think about Auburn's rivalries. They got Georgia and Alabama, and then I'm sure they'll just get a you know a, a, a cream puff game. But I mean, like, I mean, that's rough, man. So I mean, like, yeah, if you're Tennessee, you, I mean, you Tennessee's had to play to Alabama. Be, I mean, welcome welcome to the SEC. Tennessee's had to play Alabama. Well, yeah, every yeah, year. they're getting what Tennessee's got the last several, you know, you know the last decade and a half. I know I'm with you. I'm totally with you. I'm just saying that's where the belly aching comes in. Yeah, yeah. but but. And again, my point being, you know, that you have no, nobody really has three ma three major rivals. I mean, not enough schools have three major rivals, right? What do you got to preserve? Okay, Rob, look at this. You got to preserve Georgia Auburn because that's the longest standing rivalry in the league, right? You got to preserve the Egg Bowl. You got to preserve the Iron Bowl. Okay, 
most people think you got to preserve the third Saturday in October, which I don't disagree with. Cocktail party. Cocktail okay, party, you got to yeah. preserve Georgia, Florida, because of, of that one. What what else in there is? What else in the, you got to you got to preserve Oklahoma, Texas, because that's the Red River rivalry as they're coming in. What other ones do you have to preserve? I mean, is is Florida LSU has that become such a rivalry in fifteen years that you got to keep that one? I, I don't think there's that many where you say, well, these are their three natural rivals. Because Hubbard, like, Hubbard, hey, would, would, they, would they show that Goodyear blimp shot of the fairgrounds outside Columbia and Texas A and M's in town in, in in September? That doesn't didn't, <laughs> didn't put a tear didn't, didn't make it a little misty in the in the in the room. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean you know, and, and so that's that's why I say rotate more, but preserve, preserve those those schools, you know, that have had those longstanding rivalries and, and and go from there. But because I think over time that it it would equal out more that way. Because you're right, Austin, it, you know, if you're going to do the six three model with your three natural rivals, Georgia is going to get Auburn, Florida, and then you're going to give them South Carolina. Then you'll give them, you know, you'll give them an easier game. So that's their three, okay. That's if you did, se- if you did seven two, you're still going to give them Alabama. You're still going to give them Florida and Auburn, yep. and then they just rotate more. That that's my point. Is I don't think there's enough. If you did a seven two, who's going to say, oh, we lost that rivalry game? No, I what well, nope. I I think why they won't do the seven two is because. They want to be able to give a school an easier game and go see you have this team because if it's seven two then then you know they're sitting there like we got Auburn in it and out and and Florida or we got Georgia and Alabama like if you're Auburn who are you getting you're gonna get who right Alabama and Georgia <laughs> right they want to be able to say you also got Ole Miss or Mississippi State <laughs> to be clear and Brent I know you were just saying what you would do seven two is not on the table no no it's yeah, not gonna seven happen. two is not gonna happen that's it's gonna hub, be six that's three that, that, it's, that's it's that, a hub special that is it's, my hot that is my hot take I mean I would have also considered keeping keeping divisions and moving Alabama Auburn over yeah now it would be a heck of a division but you preserve all your rivalries that way yeah. here's here's the thing we know it's cycle you know, everything goes in cycles you can't look at it in in just the narrow right now Oh, they've got Nick Saban at Alabama. Nobody wants to play Alabama. I mean, there was a time 15 years ago that everybody went, "I'll take Alabama. Can I have them? Put them on my put them on my list." And Tennessee when, had them when, every year. When Jim Donnan and Ray Goff was at Georgia, everybody's going, "Can we get them on the schedule? When, when can we have them?" So you, you can't just look at where they are exactly right now. You got to think of it 20 or 30 years. I like divisional splits, Rob. I. I I like doing that and in, in, in creating that environment in your championship game. But but that's that's my old crusty nature, and everybody's going to post on the message board after they watch this that, that Hubs is out to lunch because you just take the two best teams. And if that's a rematch of, you know, Alabama and LSU in the SEC championship game, then that's a rematch of that. You don't do Eastern and division splits. But I kind of like the East, East-West split personally. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I like it too. Brent, I, I get all your points. I just think when you're going to this many teams, it just it's it's unwieldy. And yeah. I mean, you're never. I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, at all. But you just, I, I'll the conference is getting to be so big. I like the idea of having six opponents that rotate, so at least you get a feeling that you play them every once in a while, as opposed to, you know, the only time you see them is in the championship game or, or you know, some weird kind of setup. I, 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 I totally get the merit of your argument but this you know for Tennessee you're not to play Oklahoma for five or six years uh, I, I like this you know the three six sure. matchup because of that yeah and I agree with that that's the downside to divisional plays you don't get over there and play those teams and and and, and I like the fact that if a kid stays for four years he's gonna be able to play in every venue you know yeah. and and so I, I think that makes the most sense you also want to avoid Tennessee, Mississippi State in the SEC championship game in '98, right? Yep. Because they weren't the two best teams in the in the league. So I get that part of it as well, and and that's why divisional play was once they could get that off the off the charts, they got that thing out of there, just like they did in basketball for seeding purposes. Instead of going on the board and and, and being rude to Hubs or starting the the 18th Chinese spy balloon thread. Now here's the exercise we should do. All right, we should do who would that third. Who would that third team be in the in the six three model, right? I mean, for Tennessee, it'd be Vanderbilt, it'd be Alabama. My demo would say Florida, maybe Kentucky. You got Georgia. I mean, for Tennessee's sake, there's a lot of options here. 
But to your point, Brent, there's not those type of options for the majority of schools around the conference. Look, Tennessee's going to win in the 6-3 model because they're going to get Alabama, Vanderbilt, Kentucky. Yeah. And that's a win for Tennessee. No, it's yep. a huge win. If, that's, if, that, if Kentucky's the 13, then yes, that's the win for yeah. Tennessee. And, and I, I mean – I think that I mean they're not going to give Georgia, Florida, Auburn, and Tennessee as their three. It's not going to happen. Georgia's out, but you'll play Georgia every other year, right? Which is better than every year. Yeah, and you're not going to play South Carolina. They're going to give you Kentucky because you've got a long history. Maybe they can bring the beer barrel back while they're in the process of of showing every. If it's such a natural rival, Rob, that it's one of your three, maybe you should bring back the trophy that you play for. Um, as one of your rivalry games there. I don't know that it'll happen, but maybe we can do that. But I, I think it's absolutely going to be Tennessee, Vanderbilt, and Alabama in the 6-3 mile. I agree. Which is good for Tennessee. It is great for Tennessee, absolutely. Will that happen in 24? Will that happen in 2025? You know, we'll see. Conflicting Depends on reports. if Austin writes the check. <laughs> yeah. Conflicting reports on Friday, at least, kind of on, on both sides of the thing. So we'll have to have to see what that feel, looks like. If they didn't bring back the beer barrel, but they they, they, they they made it a whiskey barrel, and it was half Jim Bean, half Jack Daniels. Uh, don't don't get me started on that soapbox, because when I every time I walk into Commonwealth Stadium and I see how many millions of dollars that they are taking from bourbon companies, the Woodford Reserve Lounge, yeah, for their suites, and but but yet. It's offensive to bring back the beer barrel because it sends a bad message. I'm I, I got nothing. All those like, people that were going to start threads about you because your your thoughts on the seven two now we're going to start threads about supporting you because you're, you're getting on that. So that's my right, baby. They're all boy. team hover. Add a boy hashtag not, team hover. It's not, like do it. it's not like they were chugging beer after the game on the sideline out of the barrel or anything. It's just a bar- it's just a old whiskey barrel. I mean, there, there's no reason not to have it. Absolutely none. <laughs> Yeah, because nobody on either team drinks. Ah! None. I mean, I get, I get why it was suspended and went away, but that, 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 it's been long enough. They should bring that back because it's a tradition, and and this remember this league is about tradition. You want to try to preserve as many of them as you can. That's a soapbox that was not on the topic of of, of agenda for today's podcast. I apologize. And it's way cooler than a boot. So I mean, come on, or an axe or. Whatever else. What, what's the thing? What do they, what do they play for in the Missouri Arkansas game? What's that thing they play for? Looks like an ice sculpture. I don't even know what they call that thing. Yeah, know. it's, I mean, it's the, the beer barrel's cool. It's cool. All right, that's it uh, here for today on this Tuesday. We'll be back on Thursday. Get your mailbag questions in over on the Journal's quarters for Brent Hubs. Rob Lewis, Austin Price. I am Eric Kane. Don't forget twenty nine ninety nine one year subscription. To VolQuest.com. That deal is good up until is good until kickoff. $29.99 for one year at VolQuest.com. An incredible deal. Go ahead and take advantage of it today. Appreciate you guys for joining us. Get in those mailbag questions, and we will see you on Thursday. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody. 